Thank you, Trudy, for that introduction. And first up, uh, I just want to give a big thanks to the Full Indie Summit for enabling me to be here. Uh, I'm so stoked to be an indie developer. And I'm really, really grateful to get this opportunity to be here today and to speak about a project that's very close to my heart. Um, so making secretly persuasive games. Uh, just. A uh, quick content warning before we begin. Uh, there will be some slides in this talk that contain depictions of cartoon penises and anuses. Uh, if you don't want to see that, uh, now is a good time to leave. Um, so my name is Robbie Fraser, uh, and that's my Twitter handle. Uh, I'm an indie developer, and I work with my friends at a relatively small indie studio based in Cape Town. Uh, that's us on the left. Um, our studio is called Free Lives, and we're most well known for games like Broforce, Gorn, and of course, Genital Jousting, which is what I'm here to speak to you about today. So, uh, just to clarify, Genital Jousting has a party game component to it, but I'm going to be talking pretty much exclusively about the story mode. Uh, as far as we're concerned, that's the real meat of the game, and so for the purposes of this talk, I'm, I'm just going to be talking about the story mode. Uh, if you haven't heard of it before, uh, Genital Jousting Story Mode is a single-player, fully narrated, uh, linear story about an anthropomorphic penis named John, who is trying desperately to find a date for his upcoming high school reunion. Uh, you can think of it kind of like a cross between Octodad and the Stanley Parable, uh, but everyone in the world is a penis. Um, so it's a comedy game. I hope that much is evident but it also has a, a very real story to tell about a man who grew up in a patriarchal environment and has been socialized to have a rather problematic view of the world. So John, our protagonist, is kind of the, the poster child for toxic masculinity. Um, just give me one second here. I have to learn how to scroll on a Mac. Um, Right, and so it's, it's really a story about John making a lot of mistakes, but eventually gain, gaining some self-awareness and starting to learn and unlearn what it means to be a man. Um, the core team behind the story was myself and three other straight white men, uh, pretty much just default game developers, if you want to think of it that way. Um, and in a lot of ways, the four of us have each walked a similar path to John, where each somewhere along our own journey of overcoming our patriarchal biases and unlearning our socialized behaviors. And we're also always still trying to figure out how to be better people. Um, and that was the story we wanted to tell. Uh, General Jousting is a critique of toxic masculine culture, and it's a story about overcoming it. Um, but the problem with making a game about toxic masculinity is that we weren't sure that anyone would want to play it. Uh, least of all toxic men. And that's a problem for a lot of feminist games. So people make all these wonderful games with amazing ideas and important social messages, but they're usually hidden away on an itch page in the tiny corner of the internet, and the people who most need to hear those messages are never going to find those plane, find those games or choose to play them. Um, so those games might be like very good at what they do, they might be more meaningful and more thought-provoking than we could ever dream to be, but if only a few people play those games and those people already agree with the message of the game, uh, then how big is the actual impact of those games on society? Uh, and can we do better? So the, the unfortunate reality is that Joe Steam Gamer isn't going to play your game about toxic masculinity unless you find a way to put it in front of him and you're very clever about how you hide your feminist agenda. Um, so our, 
our hypothesis <laughs> So our hypothesis was that making a more mainstream game could in fact be a more effective way uh, to like affect actual social change. Uh, and so we went into general jousting with the intention of trying to make a big budget Steam game, uh, something that had a lot of appeal to the Steam audience, uh, something that could be popular, uh, something that gamers would choose to buy and play. Uh, and so we went to make this silly physics game with a lot of penis jokes in it, and the idea was to use that loud, crass exterior as a bit of a Trojan horse to deliver a story that was deeper and more meaningful than what people were expecting. Uh, and hopefully we could make them think of it too. Um, so we had the story we wanted to tell and we had this message we wanted to get across. The next thing to do was to figure out how to get our audience to actually take the message on board. Um, and so I've identified three things that we tried to do that we thought were important uh, in order to give general jousting a better chance at landing its message. Um, Okay, and so I'm just gonna jump right into it. Three things for making a secretly persuasive game. Uh, thing number one is obfuscation, AKA hiding your intentions. So in psychology, there's a, there's a very well-researched well phenomenon called psychological reactance. And what that means is if I think you're trying to change my mind, uh, I'm gonna put up my barriers and resist whatever it is you're trying to say. Uh, this happens even if I already agree with you. It doesn't matter what you're saying. We all just have this built-in psychological defense mechanism that triggers whenever we think someone is trying to change our mind without us knowing. Um, and that's why it was so important for us that we obfuscate the intended message of the game. We had to be very careful about how we branded genital jousting. Uh, we knew that if we branded the game as a story about the dangers of toxic masculinity that our target audience would immediately dismiss a lot of the game's ideas or just not play it at all. Um, so none of the trailers, none of the screenshots, none of the store copy uh, give any notion about what the themes of the game might be. Uh, those things are just marketing. They're just here to say, hey, if you like silly physics games or penis jokes, then this is the game for you. Uh, once you've convinced someone to play your game, then you can focus on presenting your ideas. Uh, but even then, though, uh, we were very careful not to present things too literally or to be too moralizing. Uh, genital jousting doesn't say, hey, don't think like this, that's how a jerk would think, uh, but instead prefers to step you through John's thought processes and then show you the results of John's actions in the world. And with the right emphasis and repetition, we hope that players would be able to make all the connections by themselves. Um, so that's thing number one, hide your intentions. Thing number two is intermixing, and this is another way of avoiding that psychological reactance response. So to reiterate, we don't want to appear like we're trying to persuade the player of anything. And the idea of intermixing basically just means mixing up the on-message parts of the game with off-message parts. Um, if the player starts to see a pattern of persuasion occurring, uh, they're gonna become suspicious and dismissive. Um, so for every moment where we tried to make a point about John's sexist behavior, we also threw in like several jokes and gameplay sequences and bits of other unrelated nonsense to, to mix it up. For example, um, so there's a scene in the game where John decides to ask out his coworker Barbara during the middle of a board meeting. And this is supposed to come across as like inappropriate, creepy, and entitled. Uh, but we don't dwell on it for too long. And then at the end of the day, despite Barbara's protests, John insists on walking her home because he's hoping that she might sleep with him. Again, super creepy behavior. Um, but in, the t in between these two scenes, there's a whole bunch of jokes and absurdity where you like eat a bunch of chicken and break a bunch of beer bottles and other silly stuff like that. And the point is that if the whole game was just a string of situations where John acts creepily and then the game admonishes him for it, A, people wouldn't enjoy playing it very much, and B, gamers would just dismiss it as feminist propaganda. So because we put a whole bunch of jokes and other stuff in there, people don't realize that the game is in fact basically just a string of situations where John acts like a creep and is then admonished for it. Um, so that's thing number two, intermix the on-message parts of the game with off-message parts. Okay, and then thing number three is all about making the story relatable. Um, so John 
is a bad person. Uh, there's no way around that. His behavior is completely inexcusable, and that's the way we needed it to be for the story we wanted to tell. Um, if that's the case, though, how do we keep players engaged in his story? Uh, how do we get people to care about John? And what's to stop someone saying, hey, this guy is garbage, why am I even playing this, and then putting the controller down forever? Uh, so how do you write a story with an unlikable protagonist? Uh, the answer we thought was to try and get players to relate to John as much as possible, despite how unlikable he is. We wanted players to understand his motivation and even feel sorry for him at times. Um, but there's a big catch. Uh, if we make John too relatable or make the audience too sympathetic towards him, we run the risk of justifying his behavior. Uh, we didn't want to make John's toxic views start to seem reasonable, so we had to be very careful to get this balance right. Um, in the end, what we came up with is a system where we build sympathy for the character and then strategically burn it again. Um, so what you can see here is a graph of the player's sympathy towards John as the story progresses. Um, at the start of the game, sympathy is high. Uh, we haven't shown John to be a toxic character just yet, and he has some very real problems. Uh, he's clearly suffered some trauma in the past. He's genuinely sad and genuinely lonely, and we can all relate to John at this point. Um, at the start of the game, the player is on John's side. What ensues next is a series of events where John tries to find a date for his reunion, but fails. And each time John messes up, it's because he's chasing some sort of false symbol of masculinity uh, that he thinks will make women fall for him. So whether it's money or muscles or, or status or whatever it is, it's always the wrong thing. And John always treats the women in these scenarios very badly. Um, and so sympathy drops. Uh, it's definitely starting to seem like John might be an actual jerk and not just a misunderstood guy who's been romantically unlucky. Um, but then we build it up again. So some bad things happen to John. He goes on some terrible dates that aren't necessarily his fault. Uh, he has more nightmares. Um, the writing and the music shift to present him more sympathetically, and the, the tone starts to become a little more uplifting again. Uh, this time, it'll work out. This time, John will find what he's looking for. Um, but of course, it doesn't work out, and the cycle continues. Uh, but crucially, at this point, players start to notice the pattern. Uh, John never learns anything, and as he gets more desperate, his actions just get worse and worse and worse. So each time the cycle repeats, player sympathy drops lower and lower and lower. Um, and as we approach that final dip, uh, player sympathy has pretty much run out. At this point, most people have realized that John himself is the problem, uh, but hopefully they're now invested enough in the story to keep playing. Um, the game does a really good job of continuously counting down towards the reunion, so you can you can really feel that the climax of the story is approaching. And players are now no longer rooting for John, but they, they do want to know how the story ends for him. Uh, the climax of the story is rock bottom for player sympathy. Uh, sorry if I'm spoiling this for any of you, but the reunion really doesn't go well for John. Um, and then after the climax, um, we have the ending of the game. Um, so this was something that we really struggled with a lot, and it took us a long time to figure out how to do it properly. Um, because John is such a toxic character, it was important that he didn't have a happy ending. Um, if you make a game with toxic characters and you don't show that toxicity be, to be a bad thing, uh, then you haven't made a game about to toxicity so much as you've just made a toxic game. Um, we felt that we had a moral responsibility to show players the negative consequences of John's actions and to properly disavow them. Uh, if John still gets the girl at the end, then we're just reinforcing his behavior. But we also didn't want to make the ending of the story feel too disappointing. Uh, we knew how important it is for a narrative game to have a strong ending, and from John's perspective, the ending of General Jousting is a total anticlimax. Um, we didn't want players' final experience of the game to leave a bad taste in their mouths. Um, and so that's why we see that little rise in sympathy at the end of the game. Uh, we didn't want to necessarily offer John redemption for what he's done, but we did 
want to offer him a little self-awareness and start him on a path to becoming a better person. Uh, we wanted to show that if you are someone who's fallen into the same hole as John, that there's a way out and that you can start interrogating yourself uh, and that change is possible. Uh, and so the game ends with a slightly more uplifting tone. Tom real, uh, John realizes he be, he's been wrong about a lot of things, and he's finally able to reach out uh, to a friend and ask for help. OK, so those are the three biggest things that we try to do in order to present the message of the game in the most effective way we could think of. Uh, the next question is, did any of it actually work? Uh, did the game reach its audience, and did it actually affect anyone? Or was all of that stuff just a pipe dream? Um, obviously, it's difficult to measure the impact of any single piece of culture on society as a whole. Uh, but I can definitely talk about the way the game was received. Um, and this is another thing that we really weren't sure about uh, in the lead up to release. Um, so we had this hypothesis about making a mass market game with a, a hidden layer of substance, but it was really just a theory at that point, and we didn't know how people would respond. Um, so we got a lot, lot of responses to the game that were pretty much what we expected. Um, people were surprised that the game exists at all. Um, then they were surprised that it has a fully narrated story mode. Uh, and then they were surprised that the story goes as deep as it does. And this was the reaction we had hoped for. Um, we tried to make the game surprising in those ways. And so that was all more or less according to plan. Um, but there was one thing that we hadn't necessarily predicted that I considered to be a testament to the success of genital jousting story mode. Um, and that's that the story really touched a nerve in a lot of people. Um, we had a lot of players describing the story as emotional, sad, or depressing. And for a large portion of players, especially men, uh, the story really seemed to hit a little too close to home. Um, and so after watching a lot of Let's Plays and Digging a bit deeper, uh, we saw that even though John is recognizably the villain of the piece, people sympathized with his plight. Um, they cared about his problems, even if his solutions were terrible. And even though di they didn't like John, people still felt connected to him because his fears, anxieties, and shortcomings felt like real things in the real world uh, that people face in their actual lives. Um, so I spoke at length already about making your game relatable, but I really want to belabor this point um, because uh, I think games that people can genuinely see themselves in are just way too few and far between. Uh, and that brings me to my next point, which is uh, Nathan Drake is not a real human. Um, can we, as game developers, please try and make better stories for men? Uh, I think general jousting benefited a lot from speaking from a male perspective and addressing everyday issues of masculinity not often touched by games. Um, so in addition to enabling more diverse creators and making more diverse games for more diverse audiences, uh, I think we need to make more games about what it actually means to be a man in our societies. So technically speaking, as a straight, white, uh, cisgendered man, I'm part of the most overcated for demographic in video games. Uh, most big budget games are made with people like me in mind. Uh, but while I might look like Nathan Drake, like I just cannot relate to him in any way at all. <laughs> um, his problems revolve around murdering people in the jungle and ramping jeeps out of airplanes. Uh, and yeah, those are things that I just really haven't had to deal with. Um, so what keeps me up at night is worrying about relationships, dealing with society's expectations, and, and trying to be a better and happier person in an unjust world. Uh, and those are my actual problems, not shooting things or fighting things. Uh, and so I don't only want power fantasies that offer me escapism from those problems. I also want games that help me understand and deal with those kinds of problems. Um, so. I think we can make much better games for men, and I think genital jousting is proof that gamers will respond. Um, there's a huge slice of the video game audience that are quietly craving games that make them feel spoken to as a person. Um, obviously, the same problems exist for everyone who doesn't identify as male, but I find it really strange that there are so many men in game development making so many games for other men, but none of those games are ever about what it means to be a man. 
Uh, okay, I think that's just about all I have to say. In conclusion, uh, you can make successful games that have mainstream appeal, but also include a message that mainstream audiences might not like. Um, you should, in fact, do that, because then your message will hopefully have a larger and more effective reach. Um, however, you still need to be very careful about how you present your message, especially if you think players are likely to be dismissive of it. Uh, so you can obfuscate the intended message of the game, uh, intermix on-message parts of the game with off-message parts, and make your story as relatable as possible. Use everyday human problems. Uh, and finally, let's try and make more and better games about men and masculinity. Uh, cool, thank you so much for listening to me ramble. Uh